Hi class, Dr. Searcy here. Uh, welcome to the lecture on the chapter 11 odd questions. Uh, so let's remember the title of the chapter is the t-test for two related samples. And before we actually get in the work, into the work, um, I just really quickly want to uh, review what we've been talking about over the uh, past few chapters kind of give you some insight in how to do uh, the work for today. So the review I want to do is um, to just remind you of what we've been talking about beginning in chapter 9 and then in chapter 10 and then uh, now in chapter 11. All right, so uh, in chapter 9, we started out having this new statistic introduced to us called the T statistic, right? When we first started talking about it, we said that uh, we're going to use this statistic um, as an inferential statistic. We're going to use it to figure out the difference between two different groups. When we talked about it in chapter 10, we then called it the T statistic for use with two independent samples. Right. Remember what that meant was that um, in this type of T statistic, we're going to compare, say, a, a sample one to a sample two. Right. Remember the difference between the two sample is that uh, we would have pulled them out of some population. Right. So I would have pulled a group of people out of here, put them there, and a group of people from here, put them there. Um, the two samples are two different groups of people and they're going to be treated differently by the researcher. One difference could be say, that the researcher will give one group exposure to the independent variable, right? The exposure to the treatment of the study and the other group will get no exposure to the treatment. Uh, so then the researcher is going to look at, okay, well, um, how is behavior affected in the two groups where this group was treated differently from how this group was treated, right? And so um, that's why we're calling this the two independent samples. This sample is independent of this sample. What's the independence? We did something here that we did not do something here. So then we moved into chapter 11. Right, and we continue talking about the T statistic, but now we said in chapter 11, the type of statistic that we're going to be using is we're now we're, we're working with two related samples. Right, and the idea here was that uh, these two related samples are being, going to be treated similarly to each other in some way. Right, so they're going to be unlike the two samples that you've got up here. With the two related samples, we said that there are two different ways that we could conduct this kind of study. One way was where we could conduct a repeated measures design test. And the other way was where we could conduct a matched samples test. Right? And this was uh, what we talked about at the beginning of the chapter 11 lecture notes, uh, what this type of measure looked like compared to this type of measure. One other thing that I want to do in terms of review is I also want to note that um, we said that there was an AKA, right, and also known as a, like a nickname for this type of design, and there's an AKA for this type of design as well. Remember the uh, AKA for this one is that it can be also referred to as a between subjects design. Uh, why can it be referred to as a between subjects design? Because when we're going to do our comparison, we are comparing the subjects in this sample to the subjects in this sample, right? So the comparison is between these subjects and these subjects. Hence the name, the between subjects. Uh, the nickname that we had for the two related samples, though, 
was where we could say that here we are running what's referred to as a within subjects design. Right, and uh, when I think of this, this term within subjects, uh, what we're talking about is measuring some change that occurs within each subject, him or herself. Okay, so um, I do want to describe what this design looks like compared to this design. Um, so let's do that right now. The way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to draw your attention to um, in our list of questions that we have for the homework for this week. Um, question three actually asks about these two different designs. So I'm going to start with question three for today. Uh, what question three says is to explain the difference between a match subjects design and a re repeated measures design. Right, so let's just remember in the question we're seeing here is that um, both of these are the within subjects type of design, right? It's the two related samples. One is repeated measures, the other one is match samples. Where we're seeing that, we're seeing it here, match samples, and then also here, repeated measures. Okay, uh, so I described what these two types of um, designs look like in the lecture notes, right? And in the lecture notes, it's where I talked about it right here, and then also right here. But to uh, just kind of repeat what I said earlier, uh, the way that we could diagram the way that the two designs work is if we were to talk about the, uh, let's talk about the repeated measures design first, right? What does this look like? We would say that um, it could begin, right? So I'm, I'm calling it repeated measures, the repeated measures design, RM for repeated measures. We're saying that we begin by going to some population of interest. Uh, we approach that population of interest and we pull out one group of participants. Maybe another way I could say that is instead of calling it a group, we're pulling out one sample of participants. Right? What am I going to do with that one sample of participants in this design, the repeated measures design? What we're going to do is we're going to take that one sample and we're going to give them both conditions in the experiment, right? So they're going to get exposed to condition number one and also condition number two. What that might what might that look like? It would look like where um, for that one sample, they're going to spend some time in this condition, right? What, what would that condition be? That would be where, say, maybe uh, they're getting exposed to the independent variable. They're getting exposed to the treatment. Right, so their behavior is going to be measured while they're being exposed to the treatment. Then, after being exposed to that condition, they're going to, that one sample is going to move from this condition to the second condition, and that being where there is no IV present, right? There is no treatment present. So what's going to happen here is their behavior is going to be measured again, now under the influence of the IV being absent. Right, so how is this a repeated measure design? We're repeatedly measuring one sample participants, right? We're measuring them here, and then we're measuring them again here. Okay, so that's the explanation for what a repeated measures design looks like. Now let's go ahead and uh, make sure that we remember what the match subjects design looked like. That was where we would say that uh, we can start a diagram right here where we're saying match subjects, right? MS for match subjects. And the thing that we're saying that we're doing is we're going to a population again, we're approaching that population, and we're gonna pull some participants out of that population. What we do though, we're gonna pull one pair of participants out at a time, right? And that one pair, those two, those two subjects, when we pull them out, they're gonna get pulled out together with the idea that they are similar in some way. Uh, remember that's what we said back in our description in the lecture notes. They were picked out based on some similarity. Then we take that pair of participants, we split the pair up, we put one participant in one treatment condition, and then we put the other participant in that pair 
in the other treatment condition. Right, so match subjects in the sense that um, you have these match subjects, right? They're similar in some way, and one is going to one condition, the other is going into the other condition. Okay, uh, so with that explanation of what those two designs look like, let's uh, now go to question number one in this week's list of questions and see if we can understand when we would use each type of design then. Right, so here uh, we're going to say that uh, what we're going to be looking at is um, for each of the following studies, determine whether a repeated measure is t-test is the appropriate analysis. All right, so basically what they're going to be asking us, they're going to give us uh, three different descriptions of three different studies. And for each description, they're going to be asking, um, is the study that's being run here, is it an example of an independent studies design? Right, so it would be a between subject design. Or is the example some type of repeated measures or is it some type of match uh, sample? Right, so three different types of designs that could be being used in each example. Our, the question for us is which design is actually being used. So let's go over the first question. Here it's saying, um, a researcher is examining the effect of violent video games on behavior by comparing aggressive behaviors for one group who just finished playing a violent video game with another group who played a neutral game. Okay, so which design is being used here? To answer the question, first thing we want to get a sense of is, first, how many groups are there in this study? Here we're seeing that we've got one group here and then a second group there. That means that obviously um, could not be this type of design, right? Because that's the one where it was just a one group. So it could be either this type of design or this type of design uh, because you could have multiple samples here or multiple samples there. So to figure out which one it is, is it a match or is it uh, two independent samples? Go back to the question. Remember, if it was this one, then in the description, they would have talked about something about um, matching the participants before assigning them to groups. You don't see that in the description, right? There's no information about matching. All you've got is that one group was treated one way and a, a second group was treated a different way. So uh, the answer to that question then must be that of the three types of designs that we're working with here, the type of design that we got is the independent measures, right? The independent uh, where there's the two samples. Why is it like that? It's like that because you have two separate groups that are being compared to each other. And like I said, uh, there's no information about them being matched to their um, participants, or to the pair, when they're pulled out of the population. Okay, so on to question B. This one says, uh, a researcher is examining the effect on humor, on memory, by presenting a group of participants with a series of humorous and not humorous sentences, and then recording how many of each type of sentence is recalled by each participant. Okay, so the first question I have here is how many groups are there in this description? I just see that there's one group of participants that's being um, dealt with, right? And that one group is being shown both humorous stimuli and not humorous stimuli. And then each person in the group is being asked to um, rate their reaction. So what kind of study must this be then? It must be a repeated measures design. Why repeated measures design? Because one group is getting two scores compared, right? So the one group is getting the reaction to the humorous and also the not humorous stimuli uh, being measured. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to question C then. This one says, a researcher is evaluating the effectiveness of a new cholesterol medication by recording the cholesterol level for each individual in a sample before they start taking the medication and again after eight weeks with the medication. So first question again, how many groups are there being uh, discussed here? 
I'm saying that it's just one group, right? One sample's worth of participants. That one sample's worth of participants is having uh, behavior recorded, and it looks like it's before they start taking medication, and then again, after they start taking medication. So what kind of design must this be then? Because we've just got the one sample, and uh, the one sample is getting two scores taken from it. Must be a repeated measure design. Why repeated measure design? Because one group gets uh, pre and post scores compared, right? So like that. Before they start taking medication, it's a pre-test score. And then eight weeks uh, with the medication, it's a post-test score. Okay, so that's uh, our answers to question number one. Let me go ahead and move on to question number two. Let's see what we got here, right? So uh, this is an evens question, one that you're supposed to be completing on your own. I'm just going to kind of read it just to make sure that uh, you have a sense of what you're supposed to do with it. So it says, uh, what is the defining characteristic of a repeated measures or within subject research design? And answering that question, make sure that you tell me what this is, right? That's really the, the question is being asked. Note that you can refer to this design as within subjects design. By the way, the answer to this um, is pretty much given in question number three. So I'm going to go ahead and move on from there then. And I think I can move on to a question, the last question on here. Question four. Right, so this is another easy, even question that you're going to have to answer. I'm just going to read it real quick just to make sure that we know what's going on with it. It says a researcher conducts an experiment comparing two treatment conditions with 20 scores in each treatment condition. Right, so then you've got uh, three questions around this. They're asking, uh, what would the experiment look like given the different kinds of designs? The real question that's being asked though is given each of the different types of designs, how many subjects are they going to need in each experiment? So the only hint that I'm gonna give you is that uh, in the question they're saying, there's gonna be these different treatment conditions and there's going to be 20 scores in each treatment condition. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to question number five. Then. And we'll see that for question number five, um, it reads that you've got a sample of nine individual participants in a repeated measure study that produces a sample mean difference of um, 4.25 with a sum of squares of 128 for the different scores. Question A says, uh, calculate the standard deviation for the sample of different scores. And then briefly explain what is measured by the standard deviation. Okay, so let's go over question A first. Right, First, let's remember what is standard deviation uh, standard deviation is denoted by that lowercase s, at least uh, standard deviation for the sample. How do we get this value? Right, the way that we get it is we take the square root of sum of squares divided by your degrees of freedom. So in terms of this experiment, uh, what would that look like? They said that your sum of squares was 128, so it's going to go right there. They said that n was 9. You have to figure degrees of freedom, though. And remember, degrees of freedom was n minus 1. So it becomes 9 minus 1 gives you 8. You then uh, solve the division problem. That gives you 16. And then you solve for the square root. That gives you 4. So we're saying that for this experiment, the standard deviation is 4. What is measured by, by standard deviation? Let's remember uh, that it's the standard difference distance from the mean, right? And the way that we had talked about it um, earlier in the semester was we were going over these curves, and we we're saying that uh, if we're talking about this curve here in particular, this curve is representing sample data, right? The way they know it's sample data is in the middle is the mean. What kind of mean? A sample mean. 
Uh, from there, remember the way that we looked at this is we always uh, looked at the x values, right, that were on the x axis. From there, we always uh, talked about this measure of standard deviation, right, that standard distance from the mean, and what we said these lines here were, right? So that's what we're solving for when we solve this stuff. And why did we get that? Remember, we used it uh, to help us find when we knew our x value, what the corresponding z value was for that. Okay, so that's everything uh, in answer to question A. Moving on to question B, it says, uh, calculate the estimated standard error for the sample mean difference. Briefly explain what is measured by the estimated standard error. Okay, so for this one, remember that the symbol that we use for this is still a standard deviation symbol, but now with a subscript, um, right? Sample mean, sample mean of what? Sample mean of difference scores. How do we calculate this? We calculate the square root of our sample variance divided by our n. Um, how do you know what sample variance is? Remember uh, what that S squared means is you're taking your S up here and you are squaring it, right? So it's going to be 4 squared, and that gives you 16, right? So that's what we're going to write right here. Okay, um, so your equation becomes the square root of 16 divided by 9. Why 9? Because that's your N and your n was not. Uh, once you've solved the division problem, right, you're 1.78, then you have to take care of the square root, it gives you uh, 1.33. Okay, uh, so that's how you get this value. But what is it, right? What is the estimated standard error? Remember our definition of it is, uh, it's how much difference is reasonable to expect between your sample mean and your population mean. The way that we're using it is, that's uh, our estimated standard error. It is our new measure of the standard deviation for the type of statistics that we're using. Okay, uh, so that's everything in answer to question number five. Just take a quick look at question number six real fast. Uh, looks like it's pretty much the same kind of problem that we've been doing across uh, several chapters now. Right, so you're being given some information. Uh, you're being given information like your N. Let's see, uh, uh, sample mean difference. Remember this, the way that we write it in this class is that symbol is sample mean, right? Uh, they use capital M, but I use X bar. They're also saying D, right? So that's sample mean difference. I'll explain that um, term in just a moment. But then you're also being given uh, the sum of squares. Okay, so when you go to do this problem, the question that's being asked at the end of the problem is uh, you're supposed to find whether there's a significant effect going on in here somewhere, and you are being given your critical value information, right? You're going to run it with an alpha of 0.05 and a two-tailed test. So what all that means is that you are going to use your four-step hypothesis uh, testing process to answer this question. Okay, just in case you uh, forgot how to do that, um, I am going to give you a quick reminder on how to do it with the next question. Right, so question number seven. Let's see, let's set this up real fast. Let's see, we got our question here. And I'll just take this down, get it secure here. And so the question's uh, reading, um, the following data are from a repeated measure study examining the effect of a treatment by measuring a group of n equals six participants before and after they received the treatment, right? So repeated measures, how do we know that? We just have one group of participants. They are being measured twice. They're being measured before treatment and after a treatment. Okay, so then uh, the authors went and created a distribution table to set up the data. Oh, here's the questions. 
Uh, question A is to first calculate the different scores and this, let's not refer to this this way, let's call this the sample mean difference, right? So we're gonna calculate different scores and we're also gonna calculate this thing called the sample mean difference. How do we go about doing that? Um, we've got our set of data here, right? Remember what's happening here is this is your one sample of participants right here, right? Your one group of participants. Remember, it's a one group because it's a pre repeated measure design. Everybody in the group is being exposed to or, or uh, having their scores measured before the treatment, right? So that's uh, each participant's scores before the treatment. And then for each participant, they also had scores measured after the treatment, right? So uh, what the research is looking at here is um, for each participant, is there a difference in their score before and after treatment? So the way that we measure that, remember, is we create this third column called the difference scores. Um, this was something that we started in this chapter in the chapter 11 lecture notes, right? Uh, maybe just to remind you, we talked about uh, different scores here. Okay, uh, so what is a different score? A different score is the difference between, for each participant, one score and another score, right? So participant A, their first score was seven, their second score was eight, so the difference between that is one. Notice that uh, it's actually a negative one, right? Seven minus eight is negative one, but we're not paying attention to any of that over here, right? We just want to know uh, what we refer to as the absolute value, right? What's just the difference between the two numbers? So we do is we create this column of different scores going all the way down for each participant. Then after we created that column, we square each value inside the column, right? And then we call that our difference values squared, right? So we got uh, 1, 49, 4, 4, 1, and 25. Remember what we need to do with this is, um, right, so, so this here, this is the difference scores that we're talking about. The other thing that we have to do with this is take this column and figure out what is the average of, this, of these uh, scores right here. And that's what this is. Okay, so um, to do that, I got that information right here. Right, so uh, to do that first, I said, okay, well, if I'm gonna figure out what the average of the scores is, I first have to figure out what the total of the scores is, right? And that's this value here, the sum of this D column. Total out of 18. How many scores were there in this sample? There were six scores in the sample. So what was the average score then? The average score was three. Remember the way I got that was, was 18 divided by six. That's what gives us the three. Uh, just know that I also have to grab a second value here. Right? I also have to calculate what, it, what the sum of the different scores squared is, right? And that's gonna be this 84 here. Remember the reason why I have to do this is because uh, when I go to calculate my t-test equation, one of the values I'm gonna need is that sum of squares, right? So uh, that is the next calculation, right? So moving from A, where we got the different scores and the um, average distance, or the average difference, now we're gonna move on to B and we're gonna calculate the sum of squares. Remember the formula, at least the computational formula is um, the sum of your different scores squared minus uh, your sum of different scores in parentheses squared divided by your n, right? So remember uh, that number is going to be this number right here. The way that I'm gonna get this number is I'm gonna take the, this sum of d, and I'm going to square it. And then the way I'm gonna get this is I'm just gonna look to see how many people were in the sample. All right, so then uh, that gives me a calculation of the 84 minus 324. 324 is what 18 is squared, 
divided by 6. That ends up giving me a sum of squares of 3. Right, so now at this point, I've calculated sum of squares. Next thing I need to calculate is sample variance. Right, the reason why I'm going to calculate sample variance uh, is because that's one of the three steps in my, um, in my hypothesis test. Remember, we're going to calculate the sample variance, then the estimated standard error, and then we're going to get t. Okay, uh, so that's basically leading to then, is there a significant treatment effect? Right, that's what this is going to answer. So at this point, we're seeing that now we're going to have to run our four-step hypothesis test. So I'm going to show you how, how I ran it. Basically, what I did was I uh, started out with step one. Right, and um, I wrote my hypothesis out this way. I said that because I'm running a two-tailed test, my hypothesis states that my null hypothesis says that um, the null hypothesis is going to be that the difference, right, the difference between these for the population is going to be zero. My alternative hypothesis, the hypothesis that I'm hoping to find, is going to be that the difference score, right, the difference between this and this, is something other than zero. If it is something other than zero, that means that there is some difference between these. Okay, so that moves me on to step two, where I have to go find my critical value. We're going to do that. I'm just going to kind of note uh, what all information I've got towards critical value. I've been told that I'm running alpha level 0.05, a two-tailed test. I need to go find my degrees of freedom. And remember, degrees of freedom in, in uh, this type of test is just n minus 1, so it's going to give us 5. I found a critical value of 2.571 when I did it. Just remember, I went to my T distribution table. I went to my two-tailed row, found my 0.05 column, looked up my um, degrees of freedom of 5, and that's how I got that 2.571. Okay, so from there, uh, that allows me to move on to step 3, where first I'm going to calculate sample variance, right? That's what's being asked for right here, sample variance. Uh, remember the way they calculate sample variance is your sum of squares divided by your degrees of freedom. I'm just saying that I looks like I oh shoot I, here's right I'm just saying that I made an error earlier <laughs> right so the error that I'm just seeing right now is that when I went to calculate sum of squares I said it was three earlier it's not three it is thirty. And so that's why I have a 30 over here. I wonder if you guys saw that earlier, if you were freaking out over that. Okay, anyway, if you saw that I made a mistake earlier over here, it's now fixed, and you're seeing that it's also fixed over here. Okay, so I'm in step three of my hypothesis test. The first step in step three is to calculate sample variance. I've just uh, found that my sample variance is six. I'm then going to use that sum of variance to go calculate this estimated standard error. All right? And remember, this is our symbol for the estimated standard error. Uh, remember, the formula for it is uh, your sum of variance over n and all of that under a square root. Right? So that ends up giving me a, a, a sum of uh, uh, estimated standard error of 1. Remember, we use that then. Right, so now we're moving into our, our step C here. Use that then to calculate your T, which is going to give your answer to step C. When that you calculate T is, uh, remember this is your, your uh, sample mean difference, right? So it's uh, this value, right? That is in your numerator, and we found that that value was this three right here. So that's why there's that three right there. And remember that in the denominator, uh, the value that you're gonna put in is your estimated center error. We found that that was the one. So that's why there's the one right here. It becomes a three divided by one, which gives you a T value of three. All right, so remember step four is to uh, make your decision. In your decision, you're comparing this number to this number. And you're asking, is this number bigger than this number? We're seeing that it is bigger than that number. And because it is bigger, 
Uh, our step four decision is to reject the null hypothesis and to say that there is a significant effect. Okay, uh, so that's everything that we have uh, then for this question number seven. With that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to question number eight. All right, so this is another one that you're going to do on your own. I'm seeing really quickly here that you're being given information again about a uh, study that's been conducted. First thing I'm looking to see is um, what type of study it is. This is like it's a uh, repeated measures design study again because there's just one group of participants, right? These uh, 16 participants. And it looks like they were uh, asked to give two scores. And uh, the, when they gave the two scores, right? Remember, we're looking at the difference between the two scores. The mean difference is this 2.6. You're also getting the sum of squares information. So you can use that information to help you answer uh, your first question, which is, uh, is there a significant difference between two groups? All right, so for question A, that's where you're going to run through steps uh, one through four. And then once you've found that answer on uh, question B, you're going to run that, um, that uh, effect size test Cohen's D. Remember, the formula for that is uh, on your Chapter 11 lecture notes. Um, Cohen's D is where you're taking that sibling difference and you're dividing it by your standard deviation. Okay, uh, so that's what you're going to do with that question. From there, I'll go ahead and move us on to the next odd question, which is... Number nine, and for this one, we're saying that we've got a pretty long looking question here. So I'm just gonna read it, um, it says, masculine themed words such as competitive, independent, analyzed, and strong are commonly used in job recruitment materials especially for job advertisements in male-dominant areas. The same study found that these words are also, uh, also make the jobs less appealing to win. In a similar study, female participants were asked to read a series of job advertisements and then rate how interesting or appealing the job appeared to be. Half of the advertisements were constructed to include several masculine-themed words, and the others were worded neutrally. The average rating for each type of advertisement was obtained for each participant. For n equals 25 participants, the mean difference between the two types of advertisements, right? So it looks like they are doing just one group again. They expose them to the masculine words and the not masculine words, and they look to see uh, what's your rating on those. They found that the difference between the two ratings was this 1.32, and then they're also giving us this sum of squares information. Okay, so the, for the, the first question they have is, is this result sufficient to conclude that there is a significant difference in the ratings uh, for two types of advertisements? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equals 0.05. Okay, so for this one, this is all steps one through four here. Okay, so uh, how did I complete steps one through four? I'll go ahead and run through those with you. First, I'm just going to jot it down, uh, the really pertinent, impor important information that I thought was going to be useful. I got, I got uh, an idea of what the N was, what the sound mean difference between the two different groups was, or I'm sorry, what the sound mean difference between the two sets of answers for the one group was, and then uh, the sum of squares. Once I had that information, I used it to complete my step one to write my hypothesis statement. By the way, uh, when you go to write your hypothesis statement, how the hypothesis looks uh, pretty much depends on how many tails you're running, right? And this the two-tail test, so I'm gonna keep on saying it this way, right? The first hypothesis is the hypothesis where I'm gonna find that there is no significant effect. Uh, if there is no significant effect, then the way that we should have things happen is that there should be no difference in the population differences. However, uh, the second hypothesis, right, the alternative hypothesis says that there is going to be a difference uh, between the two sets of answers, and because there's going to be a difference, uh, they will, their difference will not equal zero. 
Okay, so then that leads us to step two, where I went and found out what the critical value was that we're going to use to compare our t value to. First, we noted that uh, the alpha level that we're given is this 0.05. It's a two-tailed test. My degrees of freedom are 24, I don't know 24, because my n is 25. So then I went and looked that up. It gave me a critical value of 2.064. From there, um, that allows us to move to step three. First thing I'm going to do in step three is calculate my sample variance. Right, and that's sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Sum of squares is 150. Degrees of freedom is 24. So it gives me a sample uh, variance of 6.25. I'm going to use that 6.25 to figure out what my estimated standard errors. Remember, this is now my uh, variance divided by my n gives me, uh, under a square root gives me a 0.5. So I'm going to use that in my t equation. Right, That 0.5 is going to become my denominator. Remember, my numerator is my sample mean difference. And so I end up getting a t value of 2.64 that 2.64 to my 2.064 is this bigger yes it is bigger so in step four then my decision is to reject the null hypothesis and say that yes there is a significant difference uh, by the way what is the significant difference the significant difference is that masculine words impact the, the group differently than did the neutral words Okay, so that's everything for part A. Got a part B question here, and it says, uh, compute R squared to measure the size of the treatment effect. All right, so let's just remember uh, that the equation for R squared is where you take your T value that you've obtained and you square it. And that becomes the denominator, I mean, the numerator of this equation. And the denominator of the equation is where you're you take that same value, that t squared, but add your degrees of freedom to it. So for this particular problem, it became uh, 6.9696 divided by 6.9696 plus 24. Then it gave me a, a r squared value of 0 0.225. Remember, way, one way that we're supposed to know that is that um, that's supposed to be turned into a percent value then. So actually what we have is our, our square value is 22.5%. But uh, what this means is that's how much of the variance can be explained by the the, um, the intervention or the, the difference between the, the masculine words and the neutral words. Okay, so then there is this part C here, right? It says, Write a sentence describing the outcome of a hypothesis test and the measure of effect size as it would appear in a research report. I left that blank down here. Uh, I, and the reason why I left it blank was because I thought I would go ahead and uh, show you how it's written in the book that we're using. And so I'm just gonna show you that real quick here. It's, okay, so here it says, for question number nine, that was nine, right? It says, uh, part C, participants rated the masculine theme ads significantly less appealing than the neutral ads, right? And then they have the statistical information, right? You calculated a T value that 24 is your numbers, your degrees of freedom that you had in the experiment, that 2.64 is the T that you calculated you did it at this probability of 0.05, and your R squared value was that 0.225. Okay, so that's how you would write it out uh, in a research report. Okay, so from there, let's go ahead and move on to question number 10 real fast. Just take a quick look at that, give you a sense of what's going on there. Uh, again, you're being given information, looks like about one group. Um, Looking to see if they give you information about a different score here. Oh, yeah, so you do have information about a different score there. So your first question is just to um, 
find out if there's a significant difference with that different score, right? So that's your steps one through, uh, one through four for question A. And then question B is where you have to take it and calculate a confidence interval. There you may note that it's an 80% confidence interval. Just remember all you're doing is um, you're running your confidence interval equation where you're solving for this uh, population mean difference. Right, you're not given this information in the problem, but you are given that sample mean difference, that's this uh, 4.8. You're also told uh, what T to go look up. Uh, in the equation they said, you're going to be looking up the 80%. So remember what you're going to do is you're going to go to your T distribution table. You're going to find your 80% column, and you're going to use a T value that corresponds to the degrees of freedom in your study. Once you have that, then you're also going to um, take that T and multiply it by whatever your standard error is that you get in your experiment. Remember that once you got that, then you're going to multiply these two things by each other, right? Your standard error times your t. Then once you have that, you're going to have two equations, one where you're going to take your sample mean difference and add it to whatever this is. Right, that's going to give you this over here. And you're also going to take this value and subtract it from whatever this is, and that's going to give you this value over here. Okay, so that's... Uh, your instructions for completing question number 10. Let me go ahead and move on to uh, explain how to do question number 11. Okay, so with this one, we're saying that we've got a long question here. <laughs> so I'm just going to start out by reading it real fast. It says, uh, college athletes especially males, are often perceived as having very little interest in the academic side of their college experience. One common problem is class attendance. To address the problem of class attendance, a group of researchers developed and demonstrated a relatively simple but effective intervention. The researchers asked each athlete to text his uh, academic counselor in class as soon as he arrived at the classroom. The researchers found significantly better attendance after the students began texting. Okay, so, so they're saying basically uh, in a study, they found that if students had a text when they got to class, it made attendance better. Beginning here, though, you're seeing that now they're talking about a new study that they're running. Right? And in this new study that they're running, they say uh, in a similar study, a researcher monitored class attendance for a sample of n equals 16 male athletes during the first three weeks of the semester, right? So you got one group there, and that group was 16 participants long, and you're seeing that you got like this pretest score. The pretest score is uh, monitoring class attendance during the first three weeks of the semester and recording the number of minutes that each student was late to class. All right, so we could say that's like condition one. Then the athletes were asked to begin texting their arrival at the classroom, and the researcher continued to monitor attendance for another three weeks. Right, so this is condition two. Uh, the, if you're not catching what the difference between the two conditions is, in the first condition is like a like a pretest where the students uh, were arriving at class and the researcher was sitting there and watching when they would get to class, right? So like the researcher would just, okay, soon arrived at this time. Later, the, the researcher's no longer in the class. Now the way that the researcher is finding out when the student arrived is that uh, the student is texting when the student gets there. So the question is, uh, would this make a difference? Would the students arrive earlier if they had to text when they got there? So, uh, so they were saying for each athlete, the average lateness for the first three weeks and for the second three weeks were calculated, and the difference score was recorded, right? So for each athlete, what was the difference in arrival time here 
versus arrival time here. The data showed that lateness to class decreased by an average of 21 minutes, right? So that's that's your difference or your average difference score right there. And then you have the sum of squares of 29 and 40. Okay, so basically what you're seeing here is uh, when the students had to start texting when they would get to class, uh, now because they're become more accountable, they would get there 20 minutes, 21 minutes earlier. Okay, so the question that they're asking is, is that a significant difference? Uh, and that's being asked with this question A, use a two-tailed test with alpha 0.01 to determine whether testing produced a significant change in attendance. So uh, to do that, I ran through my four-step hypothesis test. Step, oh, uh, first, I just wrote down the, the pertinent information that I thought was really important to use here. But my first step was uh, to write down my hypotheses. HO, my non-hypothesis, saying that there's no difference in the difference score for the population. My alternative hypothesis is saying that there is a difference in the difference score for the population. Step two, getting my uh, critical value information. Oh, I'm seeing that I wrote everything down with the critical value here. <laughs> okay, so they told us that uh, I had a critical value, or I had an alpha value of 0.01, ran a two-tailed test, and my degrees of freedom were 15. So what's the critical value that that's gonna give us? Let's figure that out. Here's my two-tailed test. I'm gonna find my 0.01 column. That's this right here. Uh, my degrees of freedom are 15, and so it looks like my critical value is 2.947. Let's go ahead and write that down real quick. 2.947 is the critical value. Okay, from there, uh, we have to go to our calculation. First calculation is... Finding that variance, uh, it's 2940, right? 2940 divided by 15, third degrees of freedom, gives us 196. Leads to some kind of standard error value, where it's gonna take that 196, put it in our numerator, divide it by our n, that 16 gives us 3.5. So take that 3.5, pop it into my t equation. So 3.5 is going to go in the denominator. Where am I getting that 21? My 21 is my sound mean difference. So I end up with a T of 6. Does that T of 6 beat my critical value of 2.947? It sure does. So I'm going to reject my hypothesis, and I'm going to determine that there is a significant effect of this. All right, so uh, having the student's text did significantly... Um, cause them to arrive to class earlier. Okay, so that's everything in answer to question A. Let's go move on to question B. Question B is where I had to compute a 95% confidence interval to estimate the mean change. And my formula is where I'm solving for this mu difference value. How am I solving for it? I know what this is, this, and this is. Right, my sample mean difference was 21. I got this T value of 2.131. How did I get that? I looked up that 95% confidence interval value at 15 degrees freedom. Right, so that's this uh, 95% at 15 degrees of freedom. And that's that 2.131. And so I have that 2.131 there. Where am I getting this 3.5? That 3.5 is the standard error value, and that's what I calculated over here. Right, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm first going to multiply these two values to each other. right? And when I do, that gives me this um, 13... I'm sorry, uh, this uh, 7.5. Four, five, eight, five. Notice I've got it here and here. That is those two values multiplied to each other. So on the one hand, I'm taking um, the 21 and I'm subtracting this value from the 21. That gives me a 13.5. Uh, 
And then on the other hand, I'm also taking the 21 and I'm adding that value to it. Gives me a 28.5, right? So that's my two mu values that I'm solving for. Okay. Um, so that's everything on question number 11. Take a quick look at question number 12 real fast. Basically, it's the same kind of setup. You've got your mean difference information, your n. Ooh, but here you're being given just a standard deviation, or yeah, standard deviation. And then you're supposed to use it to help you answer the questions over here. Uh, one hint that I'll give you with this is um, for this problem, you do not need sum of squares, right? So remember the order of your step three calculations is first you're gonna find this, then you're gonna find that, then you're gonna find that. You can get this by knowing this. And I think I explained earlier how you get this from this. So there's your hint right there on this question. Uh, also note that, so that's your question A. Question A is you're gonna uh, do your steps one through four, or the step three right here. And then once you've done that, you're also gonna calculate that Cohen's D Cohen's D, you already got the formula for. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to question number 13. Here, we're seeing now that uh, the problem is, I'll just read the whole thing. It says, uh, research results indicate that physically attractive people are also perceived as being more intelligent. As a demonstration to this phenomenon, a researcher obtained a set of 10 photographs, five showing men who were judged to be attractive and showing and five showing men who were judged to be unattractive. The photographs were shown to uh, a sample of N equals 25 college students. Right? So one group of college students looked at both types of photographs and the students were asked to rate the intelligence of the person in the photo on a scale from one to 10. For each student, the researcher determined the average rating for the five attractive photos and the average for the five unattractive photos, and then computed the difference between the two scores uh, for the entire sample. The average difference was um, this 2.7, right? So the attractive photos rated higher, and then they're telling us what this sample standard deviation was. Are the data sufficient to conclude that there was a significant difference in perceived intelligence for the two sets of photos? Right, so basically it looks like the only thing that's being asked of us here is to do the four-step hypothesis test. First, I'll just kind of note um, what's the important information that they gave us. Important information that they gave us was they told us what N was, it was that 25. They told us what the mean difference was, that's that 2.7. And they also indirectly told us what our sample variance is. Right, they said that the standard deviation was two. If standard deviation is two, that means that your sample variance is four. I think I told you how that works earlier, so I'm not going to go over that. By the way, I think that's that same logic that was um, that you're going to use in question number eleven. Okay, so now that I have all that information, I'm seeing that I'm going to run my four-step hypothesis test uh, equate or uh, system. I'll start with the uh, first step, which is to identify my two hypotheses. Note that I'm writing it this way because it's a two-tailed test, right? Because it's a two-tailed test. I'm not uh, suggesting that the significance is gonna be in, in either direction. I'm saying that there's just gonna be a significant effect. And so that's why I'm writing it this way. From there, oh, by the way, I'm noticing that the scratch is don't worry, those scratches are just for me playing with my cat a little too roughly. But hey, she likes it. So anyway, um, here's step number two. Right, so uh, we figure out what our critical value is going to be based on our um, alpha level being 0.05, us running a two-tailed test, our degrees of freedom being 24 because our n is 25. All that means that your critical value that you're gonna use is 2.064. So then that leads to step three, the equations. We already figured that our variance is four because we were told that our standard deviation is two. So we're gonna use that to then figure out what our estimated standard error is. 
right? So our variance, sim variance is four, our n is 25, gives us a standard error of 0.4. Gonna use that in our t equation, where t is gonna equal 2.7. Where's that 2.7 coming from? That's your sound mean difference, right? And then that's divided by your standard error, which is that 0.4. Gives you 6.75. Is that bigger than our critical value of 2.064? Yes, that is bigger. So our step four then is to just simply say that we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. And we're gonna say there is a significant effect, right? So I guess the significant effect is that, um, yeah, if you are more attractive, you are going to be seen as also more intelligent. Anyway, go ahead and move on to question number 14 from there. And I'm just going to uh, breeze over this. Uh, I think that you guys have all this stuff. Just note that your question A is the one where you're going to do your four-step hypothesis test. Question B is it looks like you're going to be finding some significance, so then you're going to figure out your 95% confidence interval. And then step C is to write the sentence, demonstrating how it would appear in the research report. Right, and you just got shown how to do that. So I'm gonna um, skip over that. And that leads us to the last odds question of this lecture, question number 15. Go over this with you really fast. All right, so we'll say here, what we've got is, question says that, Research indicates that the color red increases men's attraction to women. In the original study, men were shown women's photographs presented on either a white or a red background. Photographs presented on red were rated significantly more attractive than the same photographs mounted on white. In a similar study, a researcher prepares a set of 30 women's photographs with 15 mounted on a white background and 15 mounted on red. One picture is identified as the test photograph and appears twice in the set, once on white and once on red. Each male participant looks through the entire set of photographs and rates the attractiveness of each woman in a, on a 10 point scale. The following table uh, summarizes the ratings of the test photograph. For example, if N equals nine men, right, so there were nine men in the sample. Are the ratings for the test photograph significantly different when it is presented on a red background compared to a white background? These are two-tailed tests with an alpha uh, level of 0.01. Okay, so let's just really quickly take a, a fast look at what the data look like, right? So here are our nine participants. Here's how they rated the, uh, the women on the white background and how they rated the women on the red background. Just by eyeballing the data, it looks like there is going to be a significant effect here, right? For it looks like everybody, uh, the scores went up, and not just uh, went up a little bit; they went up uh, kind of quite a bit. Okay, so remember the whole thing that we're doing here is we're measuring the difference between this set of scores and that set of scores, and that's where we have uh, this difference column here, right? So what I did was. I just took a, and I calculated the difference for each score, right? So four minus seven, three, six minus seven is one. Took all the scores, stacked them up. Got the sum of these different scores. That's this value here. Took the number of scores that I had. That's this value here. Calculated the average from that. Found that the average difference between the two scores was three. But remember the thing that we have to do after that is that once we figured this out, we also have to take this column and square all the values in it, right? So I kind of just assume that that's what I did here, right? So like I would have like written like a nine here, one there, nine there, right? Nine for this number, one for that number, and nine for that number. Gone all the way down and then added those numbers up. Had I done that, I would have found that my sum of the difference of the different scores squared would have been 99. Okay, uh, so I got all that information. Now I'm gonna use it to do my four-step hypothesis test. There's step one, step two, 0.01, two tails, degrees of freedom of eight, gives me a critical value of 3.355. So 
So then I go and um, do the math on that, right? The step through the calculations. And let's just know uh, that I kind of have to do something funky to begin with here. And so first thing I had to do is I had to go back and calculate sum of squares again, right? Um, remember, what I have to do is calculate sum variance, then the standard error, then the t. They did not give us any information on what simple variance was. So I had to go and calculate it for myself. The way that I did was remember simple variance is going to be um, a calculation of your sum of squares divided by your degrees of freedom. So I had to figure out what the sum of squares was. The way I figured it out was I took my value here, my value there, right? Because I'm going to need them here and here. I said, okay. That's going to be uh, 99, 99 there, minus 729. Where did that 729 come from? That's uh, this 27 squared divided by 9. Gives me 99 minus 81, which gives me 18. So once I found that my sum of squares value was 18, then I used that 18 to figure out my sum of variance. Came out to be 2.25. Used that as my numerator in my standard error formula. And we're here we're using n, that's why I got 9 here. So my standard error ends up being 0.5. That becomes my denominator of my t equation, where I've got 3 in the, in the uh, numerator. Where's that 3 coming from? Remember that 3 is this mean that I had here. It gives me a t of 6. My comparison value is 3.355. So that means that I can go ahead and reject the null process. Right? That's everything for number 15. Just note that the last problem that you have to do is problem number 16, and it looks like it's going to be exactly the same thing as you did for uh, your problem number 15, right? So you're being given one sample of participants, their scores on one measure, and then their scores on another measure. So you are going to go and figure out a difference column, and then you're going to square that difference column. Once you've done that, you're going to run through steps one through four to answer question A. Then you're going to calculate r squared, and then you're going to give you a nice, uh, clean sentence in a, as it would uh, be found in a research report. And that will be it for this chapter. Thank you very much. See you next time.